Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending our seminar this evening. Uh, so today, I hope to talk to you a little bit about uh, everything that you wanted to know about hip replacements. Now, that's a bit of an ambitious sort of uh, goal uh, because I don't know everything that you might want to know. But hopefully what I can do is talk to you a little bit about some of the things that people ask commonly in the office and some of the things that I hear that people want to know about um, joint replacements, particularly the hip. So this is a slide just to tell you that I am not here to represent any particular company or any particular type of uh, component. We're just here to talk specifically about the science uh, of doing hip replacements and the medical aspects of that. All right, so hip replacements began here in the United States sometime around 1969 in earnest. Before that, there had been hip replacements done as early as 1940, uh, as people were experimenting with ways of sort of reproduction of the normal function after people had sustained injury and disease. But there was a man in England named Sir John Charnley who developed what we now know as low friction arthroplasty. So that's the whole point. We want to try to duplicate the low friction that a normal human joint does. So this was done first here in 1969, the Mayo Clinic by Dr. Coventry. And since that time, over the last 52 years, we've come quite a ways in doing this. This is a list of the most common surgeries done in the United States. And you can see of these 10 things that are most commonly done, that joint replacement is number three. Uh, so it's a very common thing to occur. And there are lots of reasons about this. A lot of it has to do with our population and how it's aging and what happens to aging populations uh, as time goes on. Um, the Food and Drug Administration looks at all the operations that are done in the United States and rates, rates them from one to whatever, a thousand, depending upon all the different kinds of operations. And then they determine basically how operations help people and rank them. And in the top 10, are joint replacements. And so joint replacements are something that really improve the quality of life of patients and particularly hip replacement, which is number three. So of all the operations that we do in the country, hip replacement is number three in satisfaction and improving uh, people's quality of lives. So joint replacement is a very common procedure in the United States, roughly now around 450,000 total hips are performed a year and the numbers are going up mostly because the population is aging. So the projected numbers by 2030 are 850,000 uh, joints. And you can see by 2040, nearly 1.5 million uh, hip replacements uh, would be done. So that's quite a common operation and something that we're gonna be seeing a lot more of as time goes on. So why is this the case? I mean, what is it that is happening that is driving this? And so this graph that I'm showing here talks to you about the aging population. I think by now we all have terms that we use to group the different generations, right? So I'm a baby boomer. Maybe some of you out there are as well. And so the baby boomers are that generation of explosive births that happened at the end of World War II. Uh, and grew our population quite large. And this has been moving like a bubble through the entire society for many things. And so you've heard things in the news reports about how the baby boomers drive all kinds of different things. And now we're driving the healthcare system because it's a large bubble of people moving into that. So this graph that we show here demonstrates the differences in the number of people of certain age groups and how that's changed uh, from 1960 uh, and how it's projected to be in 2060. So you can see, instead of it being narrow at the top with a few older people and wider with younger people at the bottom, we're getting an increased number of older people in the population. Now, about 50% of people will have arthritis at least uh, in one of their knees during their lifetime. Uh, hips are not quite as common yet, but they're catching up uh, and excellent outcomes uh, can be obtained by doing things once they become refractory to all other kinds of treatments. And there are other treatments that you can do prior to having surgery. We'll talk a little bit about some of those, um, but uh, it is a procedure that has uh, gained popularity and is growing so rapidly 
because it does help people quite a bit. All right, so the average age of a patient that has this kind of surgery is around 66 years old. Now there's no absolute age limit. This is just sort of a, a middle line where people are because there are younger people that can have problems with joints uh, that cause their joints to fail. And when that happens, some of them sometimes need surgery as well. But in general, those patients that tend to accumulate wear over a lifetime and have a problem and need a joint replacement, the average age is about 66 years old. And, and this is important also because uh, when you look at how a person performs, you can measure some things about them. You can measure, for example, how many steps people take or how many repetitions of movements they do. And generally, younger people do more than older people. And, tend, and as we get older, we tend uh, to do less repetitions or less movements uh, than when we're younger. And so this has some bearing upon longevity of these implants, as we'll also talk about. All right, so hip replacement is indicated at end-stage arthritis when all other non-surgical measures have failed. That means that you've tried taking some medications, maybe you've done some physical therapy, uh, maybe you have had an injection, other things that don't require something more invasive like a surgery uh, in order to uh, take care of the problem. And, but there are points where people develop pain that's end-stage that can't be handled by any other mechanism and their quality of life begins to change and they can't function. And this operation is one that can really help them get back to their normal performance. So let's talk a little bit about what is arthritis because you'll hear that term a lot when people get joint replacements. You go to the doctor and the doctor says you have end-stage disease and you said, how do I get this? And it's arthritis. And the hallmark of this is that the cartilage inside of the knee joint begins to break down and the knee no longer moves in an efficient way. So a healthy human joint is probably one of the most efficient friction-free surfaces on the earth. And it allows movement without any friction and very smooth fashion. But when the joint wears out and the cartilage begins to wear out, then it doesn't move like that. And then you begin to develop reactions uh, to that, and you can have pain, stiffness, and difficulty doing your normal reactions. So the, the common symptoms are ones that you see here, pain, swelling, stiffness, loss of motion. These are things that people will uh, feel when they have arthritis inside of their joint. Now, osteoarthritis is the most common type of problem that occurs, and that's what we sometimes call the wear and tear arthritis. So what does that mean? Well, it means that when you're 75 years old and your knee has uh, started to hurt and creak and crunch and you haven't had any injury or any other kind of problem, it comes from something that changes inside of your joint over time. And typically that's referred to in a very large sort of bucket called osteoarthritis. Joints can go bad for other reasons though. And you can have arthritis from inflammatory kinds of conditions. And these would be things that are inherited. There could be things such as rheumatoid arthritis or things such as lupus, because lupus is a condition that causes inflammation in the body. It can be in the joint. There are other kinds of conditions such as psoriasis that can be associated with arthritis, even some inflammatory bowel kinds of, of problems. And then there are things such as gout, uh, pseudogout. These are all conditions that create environments inside of the joint where the joint becomes inflamed and it hurts the cartilage and then it doesn't last. So we're gonna take a picture uh, uh, or a look at our x-ray here. And the x-ray tells us a little bit about what's uh, going on uh, with uh, arthritis. I'm gonna to try to move my cursor here and there it is. So what you see here in this cursor is you see that this is a normal human joint right here. There's a round ball, you can see the socket. You can see a little line between the ball and the socket because this is where the cartilage exists. Cartilage is radiolucent on an x-ray, so you don't see it. So it just looks like a space. So you see that there is a space there in that joint on the left side. When you look on the right side here though, what you see is you cannot tell that there's a joint space here. You can't see it hardly at all. And um, you can also see that the hip ball here looks as though someone shaded it in with chalk. 
and that's called sclerosis. Sclerosis is a condition that occurs when there is uh, increased pressure on that bone because the cartilage is not distributing the force across the bone. And then there are other subtle changes. You can actually get a shortened limb. So if you look at this bump right here, this bump is called the lesser trochanter, and this bump is the lesser trochanter here, and you look at the pelvic bone there, you can see that they're at different heights, different levels. So this is all part of the process that you can see when someone develops arthritis in their hip. Okay, so this is uh, in graphical form here. You'll see this bluish white material here. That, that what you see at the end of like a turkey drumstick, that's articular cartilage. And articular cartilage is very smooth. And with the body's own lubricating fluid, this surface is very, very smooth. And there's not very much friction when this joint moves. And in a normal joint, you would see what you see on this x-ray. Once again, we see this round ball here. You see the socket once again, because the cartilage is normal and that's normal physiology. But when the cartilage breaks down and wears off of the bone, and it actually does wear off so that the underlying bony surface is exposed, then uh, what you will see is, sorry about that. What you will see is that the person loses their normal sort of cartilage space and the space in the joint begins to narrow. And this is the kind of x-ray that you would see in someone who has arthritis and may need a hip replacement. So non-surgical treatments can involve usually the things that doctors would tell you to do. Weight loss is a big thing. Obesity is rampant in some portions of our country and that is certainly associated with increased stress on joints and wear of joints. Sometimes by modifying your activity uh, and doing things in a different way. So instead of being a runner, you can be a bicyclist or a swimmer that you put less stress on your joint. Physical therapy can sometimes help. Physical therapy is directed exercise. You have an expert in physiology and anatomy who can direct you in doing exercises that can be beneficial to you. So sometimes that will help. Um, Anti-inflammatory medications are sometimes used by doctors to decrease inflammation in the joint and produce more comfort and sometimes injections are done as well. And then the surgical treatment would involve, of course, uh, hip replacement. So how is hip replacement done? Well, it usually takes about one and a half hour, it depends on the patient. Uh, and uh, outpatient surgery is currently more common uh, than it used to be in the past because the techniques have gotten better uh, and we're more efficient at doing it, uh, less invasive when we do it. And sometimes people can have surgery at eight o'clock in the morning and at, by one o'clock in the afternoon, they can get up, they can walk to the bathroom, they can walk 150 feet, get in and out of the bed and go up a flight of stairs. Sounds like a lot to do right after surgery, but that's a very common sort of thing. And if you do stay in the hospital after a surgery, it's usually not longer than one night. And by the next morning, all those things a person's able to do. Anesthesias that are given in order to keep you comfortable during the time of the operation are either a general anesthetic or spinal anesthetic. And sometimes these are augmented with nerve blocks. So what this does is it makes the experience better for the patient and there's less pain associated with it. Um, I'm always surprised how some patients with very painful hips the following day after surgery or that afternoon will say, you know, I'm a little sore from having had surgery, but that terrible pain that I had that I couldn't move my leg or I couldn't get in and out of the car or I couldn't get out of the chair, that's gone. I don't feel that anymore. So uh, it's amazing how well people do and how quickly they do because of these new techniques. They also use what are called multimodal pain management. So rather than just giving you a pain pill, there are medications that you receive before surgery in the preoperative area and during the surgery and things that we inject at the time of surgery to help make your experience better and you have less pain. So uh, this is another graphic to show you a little bit about what it looks like to do a hip replacement. Here's our hip again, showing loss of cartilage across the joint here and worn out. And this is what happens after. And we'll show you some more pictures of this as we go forward so that you can see what it looks like. But basically here's a hip replacement. And what a hip replacement is, is basically a stem that attaches to a ball to replace the worn out hip ball that you had. And then we put a liner in the socket and there's a low friction uh, surface 
that the ball articulates on, and that is usually high density polyethylene. So how's a hip replacement done and what's the best way to do it? I often get that question. So there's three basic different surgical approaches. Um, there's an anterior approach, which means that uh, your, your incision is made from the front portion of the patient. And these are done with the patient laying sometimes on their back um, and uh, the incision goes through the front portion of the hip. There is a lateral incision or a so-called direct or anterior lateral approach where a person is laying on their side, but when you make your incision and you make an approach to the hip, instead of going around the posterior aspect of the hip, you go through the front portion. And then there is a posterior approach to the hip, uh, which uh, goes around the back portion of the hip joint. So patients ask me, well, which one is the best one, right? Because we all wanna do the best for ourselves and know which is the best one. And the answer is there is no best one. There are three different approaches. Surgeons use them based upon their experience and their facility with being able to do them. It, there have been discussions regarding what type of things occur with respect to recovery times. And at six weeks, really, when most people are gaining their activities and going back to normal life activities, there's really not any difference between any of the particular approaches. So why would a surgeon choose one approach as opposed to the other? So each approach, is associated with its own set of complications and particular difficulties because you have to move the bone in a different way in order to put these components in. Uh, there's oftentimes people will tell me, well, in some approaches, you don't have to cut any muscles or any tendons or any ligaments. And so when they tell me that, I say, all right, I want you to think about this for a minute. I have to remove a portion of your bone. I have to put a stem in the bone, attach a ball to it, and then put something in your socket that that ball articulates with. I think for a moment how one could do that without cutting any muscles or tendons. So it's just a matter of a selection of how you approach and what you release in the process of going uh, forward. And patients uh, do well with all of these approaches in the hands of an experienced surgeon. So the biggest question is not necessarily how it's done or which way it's done, but how many does your surgeon do and how facile is he with that particular sort of um, approach. Um, I recently had a patient that had a, a hip replacement done and I use the uh, minimally invasive posterior approach. Uh, and he sent me a, um, a YouTube link uh, of him dancing at three weeks doing line dancing. So it, it depends on the patient. It depends on the circumstances that determine how quickly you recover. Uh, but all three of these are reasonable ways to proceed with doing this operation. All right, so this is what a hip replacement looks like. It's basically a cup, and the cup is going into your natural bone, into your socket, because what's happened is your hip ball has worn out, and you have to replace that hip ball with something, and so you're going to use a metal stem to attach this hip ball to, because you have to anchor it inside of the bone. And then that ball has to articulate. It has to move on something like your normal hip did before this uh, problem occurred. And that articulation is articulation with um, is an articulation with uh, a high density polyethylene. This is the low friction portion of the arthroplasty. So basically, what happens is scientifically we know that that particular uh, material creates the lowest coefficient of friction of something rubbing one on the other. And with the body's natural fluids and that particular surface, we get a nice low friction arthroplasty, which is uh, what a total hip is. So in a hip replacement surgery, we are removing that portion of the bone that is worn out. And once we remove that portion of the bone, we ream this socket and we press in and put a new socket inside of you that your new hip ball will articulate with. So the components are the acetabular cup, the liner for the cup, the stem, and whatever the femoral hip ball is. This stem is inserted down into your bone. You can see it inserted into the bone here. And it is designed in such a way that it wedges inside of the bone 
and it has a surface on it that is friendly to the bone and the bone actually grows into the surface. And so that's how you create a mechanical linkage, a solid fixation between that stem and your bone. Same thing for the socket. The socket is lined with the material that allows the bone to grow to it so that it has a nice solid fixation to you. So in America, most of the replacements that we do are what are called non-cemented replacements. Uh, in the development of this particular uh, surgery, early on, uh, it was cemented in place with a methyl methacrylate. But as the technology has gotten better, we've learned how to make the bone actually grow to the parts so that it actually becomes a part of you. And that gives a living interface between the components and the patient and makes it a nice solid uh, thing. So you see here these beads, this sort of wire mesh, this sort of surface right here. And so what we've learned to sort of make it short and hopefully a little bit more clear and direct is to duplicate the actual surfaces of the bone. If you look at the bone under a microscope, it has sort of a roughened surface that has a certain kind of area to it. And so we've learned how to do that with these components and that allows you to have bone ingrowth into these components. So what about robotics? So this is something that is a new hot topic that is coming. Uh, and what actually are we doing with robotic surgery? So in robotic surgery, what you do is you use CT scans or MRIs to create a model of the patient that's a digital model in space. And what that then allows you to do is to be able to place components into the person utilizing this digital model as an assistance or a tool. The robot doesn't do the surgery itself. It has what's called a haptic system. Now, what's a haptic system? Well, a haptic system is where the surgeon holds on to the component and this particular robot will help using its memory and the digital image that it has produced to direct the hand of the surgeon. So surgery is something that requires a lot of time and a lot of repetition to develop. And what you really want to do is to be able to reproduce your results each time you do an operation. You want to be able to put these components in in a certain way. Uh, experienced surgeons do this as a part of their normal day-to-day -day practice. But in order to decrease variance, technology has begun to develop that allows surgeons to place parts and be assisted by these devices that can help you to do that. Now, is it necessary to have that done? No. Does it decrease the amount of time it takes to recover or get better from the surgery? No. And is it absolutely something that uh, must be done and is better than um, doing it without the robot? And the answer to that is it depends on the circumstances. If you have surgeons that are high volume, that means that they're doing a lot of cases and have a lot of experience. They're very experienced in lots of different patients and how to put these parts in very precisely. Uh, but what these robots may do is, as we move forward into the future, they may allow us to be able to have the same kind of placement of these components all over everywhere, regardless of whether the surgeon is a higher or lower volume surgeon. So it's very interesting. It's relatively new technique. Uh, we do that uh, mostly for knees at this particular point, but it's developing for hips as well. So what about minimally invasive surgery? So in the old days, we used to make very, very large incisions and move lots of tissue around. So this is an image of the length of a posterior incision and how it used to be. and used to go from the posterior iliac spine all the way down the side of the leg and would expose a great amount of tissue. But since we know more about how to place these components and since we know more about how to place instruments to do exposure, we are able to limit the length of the incisions and limit the amount of tissue that's disrupted. So you remember earlier, we were talking about which approach is better. And I said that there are no approaches are better. So the reason there's no approaches I think are better is because each of the approaches has improved with respect to the amount of tissue that needs to be moved or changed in order to do this operation. So this is a example of a person holding a, a ruler to show you that instead of having to make a stem to stern incision uh, posteriorly, this incision uh, is a shorter incision, and this allows for faster recovery. 
um, like we talked about in terms of doing it as an outpatient or either staying over one night. So what are the complications that can occur? Well, um, complications are not very common. Uh, the rate of complications for hip replacement surgery at most is around 3%. That means 97% of people do very well. And there's a correlation also about whether or not a person has a complication and the health of that particular individual. So if you have a person that doesn't have any high blood pressure or diabetes, doesn't have any heart issues or difficulties, never had a history of any medical problems, that person that's the healthy baby boomer of, of the ideal body weight, then the rates of uh, complications are between 0.5 and 1%, they go down. But as you add comorbidities, then the complication rate can go up. But even in patients that have more comorbidities, 95 plus percent of patients do quite well with these operations. Uh, so the most common things that you worry about is maybe some reaction to anesthesia. That's usually mild. People don't feel good a day or so, but even they have gotten better and we've gotten better at giving certain medicines that make people feel better so they can wake up and as I said, have their surgery at eight o'clock and at one o'clock feel pretty good. Uh, medical issues that occur, sometimes people don't take very good care of themselves. And so you can discover something when you physiologically stress them. We try to preoperatively screen the patients so we don't have that happen. That's the reason why you have to go to your doctor and he has to do an EKG or check your heart or listen to your lungs. Why do I have to do all of that? Because it's just my hip. That's because things can run in the background. Infection is probably the biggest bugaboo. It's the biggest thing that we worry most about uh, in hip uh, replacements. So we try to give patients antibiotics before, during, and after surgery. Uh, we also have some special ways that they prep the skin to reduce the rates. And infection rates are around one to 3%. Bleeding uh, and blood clots are other things because you're having surgery. Bleeding is less of a problem these days. Transfusion rates are ex exceedingly low one and a half percent maybe um, in our hospital here, I know for a fact. Um, blood clots are something that can occur anytime you're having uh, any kind of musculoskeletal work done at all. People that break their tibias or uh, break their ankle, even they can have blood clots. So we give you blood thinners afterwards to try to prevent that from happening. Uh, rate of blood clot occurring is around 3%. And then there are uh, things such as injuries to nerves, tendons, blood vessels, which are rare and fracture of the bone when you put these components in, although that's rare also. Uh, hip replacement complications themselves are dislocations. Those are not very common either. The components are put together in such a way so that physiologically your movements hold them in place, uh, but uh, it's rare, but every now and then, if someone should fall or have a seizure or have some sort of other episode, uh, you can cause the components to come apart from one another uh, after surgery. Infections can occur soon after surgery. They occur usually because bacteria can enter the wound through the bloodstream. So again, when we talk about patients being pre prepped for surgery, um, sometimes we'll say, do you have any carious teeth? Do you have any problems with uh, dental things? Do you have any other sores uh, that are not healing? Because your body is connected by the blood circulation and something that is in one place can move to another place. And those bacteria like to move to places that are freshly operated on. So we have to watch for that. Uh, sometimes these problems can occur late uh, and uh, after the person is long doing well and moving forward, if they have a bacteremia or things get into their bloodstream that cause infections. So we tell people to make sure that all their dental problems are taken care of before you have operations, ideally. And if you develop some kind of infectious process, that the doctor treats you with antibiotics to prevent that bacteremia from causing that kind of problem. Signs of infections after surgery are ones that you might imagine. The wound doesn't heal, it gets red, it drains, you get a fever. Um, those kinds of things occur. Um, and your doctor will be looking for that. The good news is, is that it's rare, and that if it occurs, it occurs in the first uh, usually a few days, and it can be usually treated, uh, taken care of so that we can reduce that as a problem. Surgical complications are worse in patients that have increased risk factors. We talked about that. 
And so what are these risk factors? Well, human beings do all kinds of things and come in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. And so things like hygiene and malnutrition, obesity, all have an effect on your physiology. And these are things that the doctors tell us about all the time for other things as well, not just your hip replacement. So we've got to try to modify those risks that we have to make sure that um, we don't present ourselves at the time of surgery if we should need to do this uh, with things that we can do something about. So you can reduce these risks of complications with things like weight loss. Smoking, by the way, is very bad. Uh, we know that, but people think it's mostly bad because of its risk for lung cancer in your lungs. But it also creates chemicals in your body that restrict circulation, restrict white blood cells function, restrict healing. So there's actually a higher rate of infection in patients that smoke after hip replacement than patients that don't with no other factors being involved. We also want to make sure that your diabetes is well controlled. Um, so that, again, you can heal appropriately. And as I said, that you take care of um, dental problems. So what's my experience like after a hip replacement? And, and I talked to you a little bit earlier about the fact that people may stay in the hospital a day at the most, and some people go home the same day. You do have some discomfort associated with this, but it's not as bad as people think. Uh, and it's easily manageable with oral medications and the kind of multimodal treatments that we do to try to prevent the pain from being severe in the first place. Most people are able to fully weight bear in the surgery, the day of surgery. So that means that after having had the surgery, you can get up, you can walk to the bathroom, you usually assist your walking with a walker or some other kind of device. Most of the times a walker because it's a little bit more stable but you only use that usually for a week or so until you're able to get up and move around. At about six weeks, most patients, if they have any pain, it's pain that is better than before they had their surgery. That means they may complain of minor things. My hip's a little sore, my incision's a little tender, but the kind of pain that was causing them to be impaired in their normal day-to-day -day activities uh, and their life uh, is usually gone at that point. And at about three months, uh, people have residual minor kind of discomforts. And then you get better every three months up to a year after a hip replacement. So at three months, depending, you can start walking, you can start visiting, you can travel, you can drive. Um, and at six weeks, most people are doing that um, anyway. And it depends on the patient. Some get better even faster than that. So hip replacement is one of the operations that we do in the musculoskeletal world that really has a very high satisfaction rate. People feel better. They're really enjoying that. And their experience afterwards is less painful than say, for example, a knee replacement. And so they typically give this uh, operation high marks. And as I said, of all the operations that are done in um, the country, this one is rated number three in terms of how good it is in helping people get back to their normal activity. So what kind of activities can you do after a hip replacement? Well, uh, there's some controversy about what people should do. Uh, I tell patients that you want to uh, lower the impact on the component. As good as these hip replacements are, and some people will tell you that they feel better, almost normal after their surgery because they were having problems in the beginning. However, they are inert materials. They're metals, ceramics, plastics, and those kinds of materials wear. Now they wear at a very, very slow rate, but they wear. It's not like your normal tissues which respond to stresses by healing themselves or growing new things. And so you wanna maintain it as long as possible. So you want to avoid excessive wear. Um, some activities can present higher risk than others, right? So um, if you fall uh, or you should hit this, then you may be predisposed to causing injury that you wouldn't otherwise have if you had not had a total hip. So you wanna avoid some of those kinds of things. But uh, in terms of life, I have guys that like to ride motorcycles that go back to riding their bikes. I have people that like to ski that go back to skiing. Although I tell them don't ski moguls and, uh, and uh, sophisticated runs. I'm not a skier myself, so, but I understand that there are sophisticated runs going through trees and things of that nature. So I tell them don't do that. Um, you can swim, you can ride horses, you can ride bicycles, you can play tennis. Um, and I tell people that uh, sports that require quick cutting like basketball, 
you probably shouldn't do that. Um, and so the best thing to do is to discuss with your doctor if you're going to have the surgery, what he thinks it is capable for you to do. Um, and he uh, will give you some um, guidance regarding that. So how long does this joint last? So the common answer that we say is 15 to 20 years. Um, but the real question is, who do you put it in and how they're going to behave? That's, that gives you the answer for how long it's going to last. So if you have somebody that's mid-60s and has a joint replacement, uh, within 10 years, they're 76. Within another 10 years, they're 86. Normal expectance, ex expectancy of life in America is 89 years old on average. Now, some people live longer, uh, so that could go on for a longer period of time. But what happens as you move from the mid-60s to an older age is that the number of cycles that you tend to put on the hip replacement diminishes over time. So the farther out that you get with it, the more likely it is to last longer. You know, most of us say that there's about a 90 to 95% chance that the hip will last without anything uh, happening to it uh, for 10 years. But the materials have changed and we're beginning to see longer uh, durations of, of these functions of the implants. And so it may last longer than that. I tell people that you can expect probably 15 to 20 years with an 80 to 85% reliability. So that means that most of us, if you have a hip replacement in the mid 60s, you won't have to have another operation. Now, if you do have to have another operation, uh, that's the darker side of this because revisions typically don't have the same level of satisfaction as a primary uh, and they can be more complicated and they can be associated with more difficulties. So that's a way of saying that you want to make the patient have the greatest possibility of having this last their entire life by mitigating any factors, weight loss, making sure they're healthy, good muscle strength, selecting the patient at the right age, using the right components, making sure they're well fit to the patient. So uh, basically to summarize our talk tonight, hip replacement is something that we do when you have pain that everything else has stopped working for and you can't function, you can't do uh, normal things. Uh, it provides reliable relief and it's a good operation and people are satisfied when they have problems and they get this operation. There's no specific age limits and talking about younger people with bad hips that require surgery, that's another talk uh, and there's something about that, but it's available to them as well uh, under special circumstances and there are things that we do for them also. Complications are rare. 95 plus percent of people do not have complications and do fine. And many people do have arthritis, but it may not rise to the level where it imp impairs their function on a day-to-day -day basis. And so those, those, those are not people that would need surgery. Um, and um, if you can function, uh, there's rarely harm in delaying the amount of time it takes before you have a hip replacement. But at the point where your life is interfered with, at the point where you have pain daily, where you wake up with pain, you have pain through the day, it interferes with your life, you can't get in and out of the car, is interfering with your potential for work, this is an excellent option for you to get you back to your normal function. All right, so I really appreciate your listening to me this evening about this, and um, we're going to uh, take any questions that you might have at this point. That's really a surgeon's choice, and it depends. If there's a circumstance where the patient has particularly odd anatomy, and you're trying to put the components in and you expect that it's going to be difficult to do so because their anatomy is odd. Or certain types of uh, problems can uh, create distortions in the normal anatomy. The hip can be subluxed or the socket can be too shallow or other things. Then you might need a guide to help you uh, because the patient's normal anatomic cues are not there at the time of surgery. And so you would use a robot because it can build a model and then you can essentially do the surgery in space in the model before you do it. And then at the time of the operation, the robot helps to, to put things in that particular position. Yeah, so that's a tough one. And sometimes what will happen is, is that um, uh, at age 48, because of whatever problem that you may have, a medical problem, a congenital one, something that happened to the bone, you would need to have a hip replacement. So can you have a hip replacement? Yes. 
Can, is there a hip replacement that is currently available that you can tell somebody at that age that if they live to be 89, the hip replacement will last that length of time? The answer is no. Probably no surgeon would tell you that. Now, that being said, there are variations in types of components that we can select uh, that may give an edge towards it lasting longer as opposed to shorter. There are many options that we don't, uh, we have today that we didn't have before. And those options have to do with what kind of bearing surface we select. Uh, that means the ball and socket, what they're made out of and, uh, and how thick the plastic is. There are, there are selections that we can do to perhaps uh, do that. But for somebody who's not functioning because their hip has gone bad at that young age, uh, that can be an option for them as well. So generally speaking, if a person is healthier and stronger, their recovery is quicker, faster, and less problematic. So to the extent that you can help that, uh, that can make your course a little bit different than if you're weak. So let's use two extremes. Someone whose hip is so bad that they've been in a, a wheelchair uh, for a year is very different from someone who's been walking around for a year with a hip that's been hurting them very badly. So um, there's no one specific regimen, but that's why there's an assessment. When you go to the doctor and he sees you, he will make an assessment regarding your need for surgery, your fitness, and any kind of preparation that might be necessary to help you be ready for that. So that's an excellent question. Um, the question is, where is the role of biological treatment for arthritis in joints? That's the bigger question that you're asking. And so is there a role for utilizing PRP or stem cells in the hip? And the answer is not really quite sure yet. Um, PRP is called platelet-rich plasma, and it has elements in it that are taken from your blood that help normal healing. And if injected into areas that are inflamed, sometimes the PRP can help to calm down the inflammation and it diminishes the symptoms. Now, to date, there has been no treatment involving any biologicals that has, quote, grown cartilage or increased the life of cartilage or anything of that nature. Most of these biologicals work by decreasing inflammation, which is a significant component of pain that people have. So are people doing it? Yes, I've heard of patients doing that. Um, is it something that should be done? The answer is we don't really know. And there may be some very, very limited applications for biologicals. In general, for most hip arthritis, PRP and stem cells are not effective. So that's also a good question. You, you asked two things. One, you talked about losing 50 pounds. So I'm not sure where your weight is, but if you're thinking about losing 50 pounds, it's probably a little bit high. So think about it this way. The amount of force that goes across a joint when you walk is about five pounds per square inch for every pound that you have. So there's a multiple that occurs because of the force that occurs when your foot hits the ground when you're walking. So 50 pounds represents 250 pounds per square inch of less pressure across your joints. So that's fairly significant. So would that have a benefit? I would say that it probably would have a benefit. The second thing that you asked about is a broader question and I'm gonna answer it this way. What is hip pain like? So patients come to me and they say, I have hip pain and sometimes they reach to their buttock or to their back or lower back and say, my hip hurts right here. Uh, because that's generally what people colloquially understand what uh, hip pain comes from. Bad hips that cause pain generally cause them, like you said, on the inner portion of the thigh, in the groin, and sometimes to the area on the side of the hip called the trochanter. Those are the specific areas that are places where you will feel the pain if you have a bad hip. So the fact that it's on the inner thigh makes me a little bit concerned about the fact that you might have something going on with your hip. So a Birmingham procedure is what was commonly known as a resurfacing hip. I didn't show that tonight in our presentation, but basically what a Birmingham hip was, was you would take the worn out hip socket that I showed you here on our films, and you would sort of clean that off and put a metal cap over the, the natural hip. 
And then you would use a socket that was metal and you'd put that metal socket in the patient. And so the patient would have their own normal femoral neck and most of their bone. And you would essentially resurface the ball part and have that resurfaced ball articulating with a metal ball in the socket. The issue with that is it's what's called a metal on metal articulation, metal on metal articulation. That means that the parts that are moving together are all metal. And there was a uh, thought that metal metal articulations uh, were things that would last longer. And we could say to a person, this metal would not wear out because we were able to machine them in such a way that there would be a very small space between the socket and the ball. And that would be filled with the normal fluid, almost like an oil, and it would just float and it wouldn't uh, have any problems. That didn't always work out. And, people would sometimes have a failure of that metal uh, articulation. It would cause what's called metallosis, which is a shedding of metal ions into the hip and the socket area, and it could be problematic. So in certain circumstances and experimental circumstances and certain diseases, it's still done, but it's not as popular as a choice for total hip replacement in the United States currently.